Good afternoon and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Brinkley. I'm a sophomore studying sociology at the college and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park side and the JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation online with the hashtag JFK Junior Forum live and interact with our student run Instagram at JFK Junior Forum for, be for behind the scenes highlights. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests and, um, and Vivian Herbert. All right, good afternoon, everyone. At City Year, we have kind of a tradition where a core director will say, how are we feeling, City Year? And they'll say, fired up. So I'm gonna try that here. It's Friday, we should have a lot of energy. So how are we feeling, JFK Junior Forum? Fired up. All right, pretty good. I'm gonna try one more time, because it's the weekend. How are we feeling, JFK Junior Forum? Fired up. Gorgeous, thank you so much. All right, my name is Vivian Herbert. I'm a sophomore here at the college studying social studies, but three years ago, I was a proud City Year AmeriCorps member serving on the State Street Foundation team at the Higgins and Lewis Elementary School in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Bit of a mouthful. I am one of the hundreds, millions of people that have been positively impacted by public service. I'm honored to be here today to introduce Jody Olson, Director of the Peace Corps, and Barbara Stewart, Chief Executive Officer of the Corporation for National and Community Service. The moment I put on my city or a jacket, I immediately felt that I was part of the legacy of service to a cause greater than self. As an 18-year-old core member, I knew that I had signed up for a year of struggle and challenges and growth. What I did not know was the unparalleled joy that I would feel every single day. This is the beauty of public service that I believe brings us all here today. The idea that we are put on this earth to make the world a better and brighter place for everyone. Whether it's a third grade student or a stranger on the bus, to serve one another is to say, I see you. Or as we say at City Year, Ubuntu. My humanity is tied to yours. There's not a day that goes by where I don't miss being covered in slime and khaki and stickers. I am the person I am today because of my service with City Year. The students that I served now live on a desk, picture, in Elliott House, but they are never not at the forefront of my brain. My kids taught me bravery, determination, and the ability to make absolutely anything silly, no matter how scary or strange that thing was. There were moments that were difficult. There were days that I felt the classroom dynamic was off. I wasn't doing my best job. Or a student looked me in the eyes and said, Miss Viv, your face is really tired. And when a kid says that, you know they mean it. <laughs> I've been meeting lots of new people as a college student, and I've been having the introductions that we all have, answering questions like, what's your name? Where did you go to high school? Where are you from? These interactions make me think back about a conversation I had with CEO of City Year, Michael Brown, where he envisioned a world where one of those questions that we ask each other is, where did you serve? I'm proud to say that I served as an AmeriCorps member on the City Year through City Year Boston. I don't wear my red jacket every day anymore, even though it's very flattering and cute, <laughs> but I keep it on the back of my desk chair as a reminder that even though I took my jacket off, I still wear it invisibly every single day. My commitment to living a life of service is certain. My belief in the power of young people is unwavering. But most importantly, my gratitude to leaders like Jody Olson and Barbara Stewart, who paved the way for students like myself to serve, is immense. With all this, it is my pleasure to introduce Director of the Institute of Politics, Mark Guerin, who will be moder moderating this discussion. Thank you. Wow. Guerin, thank you. <laughs> well done, Guerin. Thank you very much for that wonderful framing and for your own service with City Air and AmeriCorps. And Frankly, thank you for bringing us together and welcome everyone to the JFK Junior Forum and to a really interesting conversation about national service. You've 
really uh, Vivian framed it well in terms of um, the opportunities that you had and that's one of the really interesting parts of our conversation this afternoon. Uh, Michael Brown, of course, is a distinguished alumnus. He is the chair of the Board of Overseers here at Harvard and with his then college roommate in Gray's Hall, they hatched this idea of City Year, Alan Casey. Uh, so they have really been great thought leaders in this space and putting together City Year, which was really the inspiration for President Clinton looking at it to put together AmeriCorps. But we're also privileged to uh, have in the audience today really the intellectual grounding that Alan and Michael had with their uh, friend and Professor Rosabeth Moss Cantor, who is here, who um, <laughs> I am certain if Michael were here and Alan were here, they would want to uh, reflect their gratitude for you as a business school professor and friend of theirs thinking through how do you set up uh, a city year and at the time as social entrepreneurs that was not obvious that was not necessarily a, a path so we're delighted to have you here professor thank you for for being here so we have uh, a fabulous panel to talk about service from the global perspective and the um, national perspective and Jody Olson Dr. Jody Olson who's the director of the Peace Corps and uh, Barbara Stewart as CEO as Vivian said of the Corporation for National Community Service and I should say I'll the outset, uh, truth in advertising. I have served as director of the Peace Corps uh, and have known Jody for some time and I was chair of the board of the Corporation for National Community Service. And so your questions may be a little more uh, probing than mine perhaps if you uh, take my background as a liability. I hope it's an informed one and one that we really can unpack some of the issues associated with service, the opportunities for service nationally, what it means in higher education uh, and the like. So we'll have some conversation for the first 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we'll open up the floor for some, for some conversation. So you can be thinking of that. So let's begin with some context setting. Um, Jody, perhaps we could start with you. Um, your background is before them, and notably the fact that you were a Peace Corps volunteer yourself. But perhaps you could start with your own journey of service and how that's been connected to your professional work and to your inform your work now as director of the Peace Corps. I was a junior in college, University of Utah, and 1964. And at the sorority dinner, someone stood up, spoke for 10 minutes, sat down, and I went, hmm, that's interesting. I had never heard of Peace Corps. At that point, it was only three years old. But I thought, let me see about that. I was engaged, and so I said to my fiance the next day, guess what? happened to me last night and who I listened to and he said well okay let's ponder that idea well 18 months later we were in Tunisia North Africa two people from Salt Lake City Utah I had never been on an airplane before here I was I say that because Sometimes we don't know when we begin a journey, a journey that leads to lifetime of service. It was sort of a random adventure in the beginning. But during those two years, I discovered I had to give myself away to make it. I didn't know the language. I had been in pre-service training. I'd been taught French, but in addition to the French, most everybody spoke Arabic. I had to understand a whole different religion and Arab culture. 14-year-old boys who were, English was their fourth language, and so why did they want to learn English? I was adrift. And what I learned during those two years were three or four critical elements. One, I had to give myself away. I couldn't stand up for who I was at that moment in time. It was much more interesting and necessary to me to listen, to see, to observe, to be present, to try to participate in whatever that was going on around me. And I gained so much in reassessing who am I? Who am I in a much broader context 
than I was in before. I also learned in that two years how much the Tunisians gave to me. I mean, I was this funny person from Salt Lake City, Utah. My language skills, skills were mediocre at best. They took time. They taught me how to cook. They taught me how to speak. They taught me how to share. They taught me how to be present in the Arab tradition. And as I finished those two years, I found how much I cared. I also found how much I had learned about myself. And my commitment was to try to serve, to give back to others what those wonderful Tunisian families and students gave to me. And whatever way I could do that, I was here to do it. And I want to say, because I was, I was intrigued by your comment about your red jacket, even when it's on the back of your chair. <laughs> I talked to a Peace Corps trainees today, and I say, you've got, maybe we don't have as much money as TC. Anyway, I say <laughs> to the trainees, you have an invisible backpack, and you're putting things in this backpack every day when you have your experience. And it's your backpack. It doesn't belong to anybody else. Nobody else even knows you have it. But it's that day-to-day -day of those 27 months. You're going to, and I was really struck by what you said, for the rest of your life, you're taking elements of what that was that's made you different, that has, teaches you to reach out to others. You're taking that out of your invisible pack, backpack mm -hmm. for years to come. And I feel that my sense of service is that backpack that those mm -hmm. wonderful people in Tunisia helped gave, give me for two years. Barbara, you've, you. you've come to your important posts through a lifetime of service and corporate work and philanthropic work. Speak to how that informs your leadership now at the corporation. Thank you uh, for that question, and thank you for inviting us to, to be here with you today. Um, so it's really more through the volunteerism path that I developed a passion for the corporation. The Corporation for National and Community Service is the sponsor of AmeriCorps and Senior Corps programs, two big and very important national service programs. But we're also the spokespersons for and the advocates for volunteerism throughout the country. And while our concentrated service done through national service is exceptionally important, to give you some sense of numbers, 75,000 Americans serve in AmeriCorps every year, making a huge difference in their community. But 77 million Americans volunteer in their community. So the impact that all of you, likely, and many others, your neighbors, your uh, fellow students are having in your communities as volunteers is also really impactful. And as you said, Mark, my background was uh, in more of the corporate sector. But when I think about what inspired me to uh, volunteer throughout my life, I really have to go back to my parents mm -hmm. and really more specifically my mom, who herself was an active volunteer, raised four children, but really was very engaged in her community in very hands-on ways. She was uh, involved with uh, creating braille books. She worked at a homeless shelter, and she also worked at a food pantry as a volunteer. And so her personal service inspired me. Um, I think for many, the opportunity to serve throughout their adult years is an important way of supplementing the pleasures of their day job. So whether you're a doctor or a banker or a lawyer or a teacher, the ability to serve in your community still is a great opportunity for personal growth and also for doing really meaningful work in the community. So you both lead the nation's most significant um, volunteer placement sending agencies. Mm -hmm. You both have the unique dis distinction, I don't know if we've had any two this year at the forum, where you've both been confirmed by the United States Senate, Senate unanimously. We should applaud them for that, <laughs> I think. Thank you. I think National Corn Muffin Day has an objection, I don't know, but um, regardless, you have that backing. Um, Talk to us about um, 
service in the national context. There's been uh, a lot of observation of how do you enhance and develop an ethos of service in the country. Could you scale it up in important ways? Could service be an element in these divided times for bringing the country together? General Stanley McChrystal at the Aspen Institute called for the expansion of service opportunities. If we have a million military placement, he's argued, why wouldn't we have a million civilian opportunities? Speak to us from your respective positions on how you think about service, how it could be scaled up from where you are at now. And, and I think, Barbara, you said 75,000 uh, members of AmeriCorps. How would we, could we, should we scale, and what would it mean as a country? Well, I'll tackle that last one first. What it would mean as a country would be that more, um, more Vivians would be in the community making a difference in schools, more kids would be tutored, more communities would be helped after disasters, more natural resources would be preserved, the kind of things that volunteers and particularly service members are doing are extremely impactful in their community. Also, more Americans would have the opportunity to experience service, to experience the personal skill building and personal development that results from service. Um, and I think also extremely important, more Americans would have the opportunity to work with each other. So people from different backgrounds would have the chance to interact with one another, to get to know someone from a different part of the country, from a different uh, religion, from a different socioeconomic background, all huge benefits of service. The issues, um, if we had more resources, we would have more AmeriCorps members, we would have more Peace Corps members. Uh, so resources are an issue, but also getting more Americans aware of their opportunities We've done some research that suggests that less than half of Americans know what AmeriCorps is, mm -hmm. which is extremely unfortunate because you can't serve in AmeriCorps if you don't know the opportunity exists. So we need to broaden the number of Americans who know about the opportunity. We need to broaden the number of nonprofits who are ready to take on AmeriCorps members. But there's a lot of room for growth, that's mm -hmm. for sure. I come uh, to a sense of service from the idea that we are all responsible for each other. And we're responsible and are stronger individuals when we are there with our family members, when we're there with our faith-based institutions, when we're there with our community institutions. That part of what I learned from the Peace Corps was actually what I was given, that they brought me into their community and said, we're helping you in this community, even as I was teaching and doing a couple of other things. And it is, we need to ask each other. We need to make very strong asks to mm -hmm. say we need to serve. I, for a few years, worked with the home-based meal program. And I was so struck at volunteers who delivered meals, which I did some of that time, that there were people living alone whose children or others were away, and what it was to deliver two meals and be there for those individuals for an hour. That's a micro comment about what service is. But in watching that over the four or five years in which I was involved, how we were helping others live longer, but what was also happening to me and the rest of us that were doing volunteer work. And we were saying in that collectivity, we're all stronger because we gave each other time and we gave each other respect. And I think that statement about needing to have a million, wanting to have a million, asking to have a million, and more, and many more, is about the gift we need to give each other across cities, across cultures, across our languages here in the United States, to also understand each other better. Mm -hmm. 
So you would have the capacity at the Peace Corps to yes. field more volunteers. Oh, we would have a capacity for more uh, Peace Corps volunteers eager to do so. Mm -hmm. And we find that those who have already done volunteers, volunteer work here at home are ones who raise their hand and say this would be exciting to go into the Peace Corps. And let me just do a quick one minute about Peace Corps. It, we have 7,000 volunteers in 61 countries. People serve for 27 months. And we are there at the invitation of the countries and the ministries who have us come. We work with counterparts in communities. We share a technical skill. Often it's because many of the volunteers have just finished college, so let's not say it's a tidied up technical skill, but it's a good beginning of a technical skill. We share who we are as individuals, as individual Americans, and then we, we make sure that that experience comes back home. And so often we then bring our families into the experience overseas uh, because of Skyping and other activities. But as I was suggesting before, what that two years is gives us a chance to try to spend the rest of our lives looking at for the other ways to serve and to give back. And but this give us that same kind of... I'm sorry? Give us that same um, thumbnail sketch of the... Of AmeriCorps? Yeah. So AmeriCorps programs um, have greater diversity. Uh, they're largely year-long opportunities, but we actually have AmeriCorps programs that are as short as three months. We have a couple of different programs. We have a residential program where uh, individuals work in teams. It, that is our only age-based program. It's for 18 to 24 year olds. And individuals work as teams, mostly in outdoor projects, a lot of conservation work. And that is also the group that does a lot of the work post disasters. So for example, we had an enormous presence in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And even after the recent fires and floods, you'll see AmeriCorps members in communities. Um, our biggest program, the largest number of AmeriCorps members serve through nonprofit organizations. So City Year is one of our largest fantastic program that's been part of AmeriCorps for its entire 25 years. We're celebrating our 25th year this year. Um, but other, thank you. <laughs> and in those 25 years, we've had over a, a million Americans serve as AmeriCorps members. But uh, uh, in addition to City Year, nonprofits that you all would be familiar with, like the American Red Cross or Habitat for Humanity or the Boys and Girls Club, and I could go on and on. There's so many wonderful organizations with whom we partner. So that's the bulk of our um, AmeriCorps opportunities, and they are literally anywhere in the country. We are in 45,000 different sites. We're in every state and in most communities. So. The opportunities vary quite a bit. As I mentioned, the ones with nonprofits can range from being in a classroom to um, helping in a setting, uh, trying to address the opioid crisis and working with individuals coming out of treatment. We work with veterans and military families. We work with um, w uh, working on conservation projects. I mean, it, the variety is enormous, which is one of our strengths and one of our complications, right? Because when you say, what's an AmeriCorps experience? It's quite varied. Um, we're also the sponsors of AmeriCorps VISTA, which is a program uh, for capacity building. It's probably as close to the Peace Corps as any of our opportunities. So those are our AmeriCorps opportunities. We also are uh, the lead agency for Senior Corps, which is a senior volunteer program as well. And while most of our AmeriCorps members are younger, there are also, there are, other than our residential program, no age limits. And we're seeing about seven or eight percent of our AmeriCorps members are either career changers or mm -hmm. later in life, uh, individuals wanting to go back and serve their community through a concentrated year of service. But the concentrated year of service or period of service is what differentiates AmeriCorps from general volunteering. So you said there are a million alums. Yes. And how many RPCVs are there? Right now we have 200 and about 235,000 returned Peace Corps volunteers. So I think that may surprise people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That a program that's 25 years old, the scaling obviously is much more for AmeriCorps, but also the visibility of AmeriCorps versus the Peace Corps. 
why is that, do you think? Why, why you, you made reference to it, that the awareness, why is it that when you have a million Americans who've done this versus 2035 over yeah. nearly 60 years, why, why don't we know more about it? So a couple things. One, I think structurally, people work with their nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So while Vivian may identify as an AmeriCorps member, she also identifies as a City Year member. So many of our alumni identify more closely with their nonprofit. Um, also, we need to be doing a better job. I mean, this is something that my colleagues and I are talking about quite a bit now, is how are we talking about ourselves? We find that our alumni are by far our strongest advocates and those are best salespersons. But there's a, an inherent inequity if you only know about AmeriCorps as an opportunity because you knew someone who did it. And so we need to be focusing on and actually uh, are talking about some strategies that we're hoping to announce in the next couple months to really extend the marketing around AmeriCorps so that more Americans know of these opportunities. If you don't know about it, you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's just, it's unfair. Is that your challenge at the Peace Corps, awareness? Awareness, yes. We, there is a fair amount of awareness of Peace Corps. We've been present now for going on 60, uh, 59 years. But at the same time, as newer groups are growing up and coming into the workforce, we need to do a much better job of getting that word out and understanding that these opportunities overseas, these are still very important and very mm -hmm. strong and create extraordinary professional and personal opportunities. I want to note, and I'm going to give credit here to Mark, that we do have also a program called Peace Corps Response, which is for, it's more likely mid-career uh, technical people that can go for three months through 12 months. And Mark was the one who created that within Peace Corps when he was Peace Corps director. So we're offering more opportunities for, as I say, mid-career and older persons to also participate overseas. And uh, Peace Corps also has no age limit. And we have four to five percent of our volunteers who are over the age of 50. Uh, one quick example, this wonderful woman in North Macedonia who had a full career working in special ed, and she retired 35 years after this wonderful career. And I saw her in a community working in special ed with a counterpart who was about 25, and the two of them had almost become like sisters, our mother and daughter, in how they were creating curricula in special ed. And she turned to me and she said, I'm not sure I ever want to go back home. I'm having too much fun <laughs> here in North Macedonia. So that we do have a variety of opportunities and we want to expand uh, the number of people who want to participate. And now you can choose your country and the kind of project that you want to serve in. And this won't surprise you, but an awful lot of Peace Corps volunteers yes are also AmeriCorps members mm -hmm. and vice versa. There's a lot of, once you get the service bug, yep. there's a lot of uh, cross-pollination. So you come to Harvard at an interesting time for service because it's certainly a lead um, theme from President Bacow. Uh, at his opening remarks at convocation, he gave incoming first-year students their homework assignment to get out their cell phones, go to the IOP website and register to vote. This year, virtually every first year student went across Cambridge and Boston as part of a day of service. The Harvard Votes Challenge has been a university-wide effort. There's engaged scholarship coursework with the faculty. It's a very interesting time at Harvard now, including internships that's always been a hallmark. And this is a university and a college specifically where service has been threaded through uh, political figures like President Kennedy for the Peace Corps to, to others, Alan and Michael, Dorothy Stoneman, a graduate founded uh, Youth Build, and certainly other than the two oldest military academies, the dean of the college frequently cites, no other college or university has given more lives in service, more medals of honor. Mm. So in service, domestic, foreign, military, national community mm. service, Harvard has been so what would you commend to us as national thought leaders in the civic and 
service space. What more could universities and colleges and perhaps Harvard be doing in ways to make a year or two of service a rite of passage for, for Harvard students or for more American students? I think that it is so important for universities, colleges, Harvard, which is, as usual, setting a great first step for a lot of other universities to follow, is to really f say strongly the importance of service and to provide the space as part of the curricula to serve, to provide the opportunities to do the community reaching out so that that experience of serving begins at age 18, 19, and in many cases now it begins in junior high and high school. But to be able to say as a university, this is who we are, we are about service, that opens up for programs like the ones that Barbara's talking about, also like Peace Corps, you're building in that framework for why service is important. You're comfortable doing it. You know where to reach out. And the modeling happens, particularly, I think, with undergraduates at universities and to say, this is really who you are before you graduate because this is how you can be for the rest of your lives. And I might elaborate on that a little bit about the long-term benefits of service. I mean, people largely come to service because they innately want to improve their community, improve the lives of other people. But we've done a lot of research on the benefits of service to the individual who serves, the skills they learn, the opportunities and in some cases hard skills, but unequivocally the skills of working in a team, managing your time, dealing with conflict, the kind of things that all employers are interested in. And then when you think very big picture about the benefits of service to our society, the importance of people getting to know others from a different background, the empathy that's developed by working in a community outside your own or your own community that may need your help, just the big picture benefits of service are so essential to what we need now. And for schools to recognize that and to be talking about service both as a benefit to the community, but a benefit to the student in terms of their personal development. And uh, again, my experience has been that people come to service for a whole lot of different reasons, but what they get out of it is often much more than, than what they give. And there could be, or is there, or what are you working on in, in terms of the connection with service with military service? Given our civilian military divide in this country, is service or your respective agencies opportunities for a better linkage to military service and national community service? I think it can be that we actually have several Peace Corps volunteers who did serve in the military. We do have some volunteers who then go on and work and join the military. What's interesting is that Peace Corps, which is a federal agency, but it's totally independent of any other agency, and to its founder, well, John Kennedy founded Peace Corps, but Sarge Shriver, his brother-in-law, was the one who actually put it together. In his infinite wisdom, he didn't want the staff at Peace Corps to serve more than five years. So you are an employee for five years, and then you turn in your badge, and you go off, and you do something else. I've done that three times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then when you've been out for that number of years, you get to come back, and you get all these other experiences coming back. But coming back to your question, Mark, we now have a very strong number of our staff who come from the military. And so when I swear in the new group, because we swear in a lot of people because you can only be there five years, what I'm finding is that exchange of staff between those that come from a military background and from another kind of service background, the richness that we offer each other and that discussion of what service means is so important and all the ways that we get that service. Mm -hmm. And we similarly have a remarkable number of former military who work at 
CNCS, but it's interesting to me a couple things about um, members who serve, our service members. One, we have a couple of programs that are specific to returning veterans. Returning veterans sometimes have challenges getting back into the civilian workforce, and they miss the team structure, and we offer a number of programs that afford returning veterans the opportunity to be an AmeriCorps member and to work in a team structure if they so desire. Um, we're also in conversation with our military brethren in terms of recruiting. Um, there's a little bit of jealousy, I'll say. Mm -hmm. The amount of money that the military spends to recruit is really quite significant. Yeah. For us, it's pretty much yeah. not much at all. Mm -hmm. um, but fortunately, service is very compelling and we're able to attract uh, many people to want to be in the Peace Corps and to be in AmeriCorps. But we have conversations with the, and, and they're continuing with our military brethren about individuals who come to them and say, uh, they want to serve, but for whatever reason, usually health related, they're not ready to be in the military, but they want to serve their country and, and AmeriCorps and Peace Corps are great opportunities for them. Would it be helpful to have joint recruiting or confusing? I, that's a really good question. I haven't even quite thought about it. I'm guessing the path is a little bit different that takes one into the military service versus the <laughs> national or US or volunteer service. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think to be aware of each other and to reference each other, but probably not in the same recruiting space directly. So we have some time for questions. So we have microphones at each side and we invite you to go up to the microphone and introduce yourself and you, your association with Harvard. And um, in the time-honored tradition of the forum, uh, questions end with a question mark. <laughs> That's our polite way of saying, keep your framing speeches to a minimum so that we can go through more questions. Why don't we start right here? Okay, awesome. Hi, how are you guys? Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a junior at the college studying social studies. Um, and so I'm really thinking about this opportunity for, as I'm looking ahead at graduating in the next year, which is, or year or so, which is terrifying. <laughs> and so I'm trying to figure out, you know, this seems like a really great post-grad opportunity. And I was wondering if you could speak to, you know, how people feel when they come back after, you know, doing two years of service or a year of service. And like, you know, they're trying to get back into maybe a more um, office-based work, work environment, something like that, how they feel? Oh, I'm happy to leap into that question. <laughs> One, this is about the time that you start thinking about applying to the Peace Corps. And what happens with the 27 months of service, it's a chance to say that during that time, we cover all the expenses, so uh, your health benefits, safety, travel, uh, we give you a living allowance that is community-based, and so you get about $300 a month, and volunteers say, gee, I don't need any more than that. What's exciting is that during that time, several things happen. One, you build a cohort and join the other 235,000 return Peace Corps volunteers who watch out for each other as you come back and uh, into the communities here. Second, we have 120 graduate schools around the country that have contributed over $11 million for graduate school tuition and eagerly look for return Peace Corps volunteers to come into graduate education. Third, you have non-competitive eligibility for federal service, which makes it very easy to come in and get a job in the federal government. Fourth, as you might have loans, we have what we call timeout, that you don't have to pay the loan and you don't have to pay any interest. And then, like with some of the AmeriCorps programs, as you do service over the years, part of that loan can be forgiven. And I also want to say, not finally, because so many other wonderful things happen, <laughs> but what we find and is that, and I've talked to 
to return volunteers, we have many now that are in the Foreign Service. We have many that work in the President's Emerging Plan for AIDS Relief all over the world. We have many that are working with the President's Malaria Initiative. We have many uh, return volunteers who are in our school systems and are in uh, university systems and are, I can keep going, that Employers love return Peace Corps volunteers, and they are happy to tell me that every day. So there's a lot of opportunity. And why do you think they love them? Uh, because uh, a couple of faculty were telling me at the University of Maryland when we were having some graduate students there, and I was there, and they said, oh my heavens, they do things twice as fast, they solve the problem, they figure it out, they don't complain, they listen, and they're comfortable with who they are in that situation. These are what we call the skills that are not quite the technical skills, but it's interesting because many of these skills are the ones that really move you forward in a job. Now, technically, volunteers come back with knowledge of writing grants because they write grants of $500 to $1,000 as part of a community. They do monitoring and evaluation of projects. They uh, work with women on maternal and child care, for example, or how to prevent HIV. So there's a fair amount of technical skill that's being learned, but it's the environment in which you provide that technical skill which is really all that learning that gives you so much extra in language and culture and presence and uh, a sense of knowing who you are in the job that employers really reach out to get. And to put a, a, another point on that, both the Peace Corps and AmeriCorps participate in something called the Employers of National Service, mm -hmm. which is a group of now more than 600 employers who give hiring preference to individuals who've been in the Peace Corps or ser mm -hmm. served in AmeriCorps. And why did they do that? For all the reasons Jody just said. Mm -hmm. AmeriCorps members, Peace Corps members, Peace Corps returning volunteers have developed expertise and skills that employers are really interested in. Vivian was exhibit A, right? I mean, didn't those of you in the room who hire people look at her, not to put you on the spot, but to say, yeah. wow, I want, I want that. I want a, a talent like that in my workforce. So we sometimes encounter parents, both the Peace Corps and AmeriCorps. We encounter parents who are hesitant about their children serving, doing a year of service because it feels like it's a little off the beaten path. But the truth is, it's truly an accelerator. It's, it's a career accelerator. And so rather than thinking about it as a gap year or something to do to find yourself, which it might be for some people, it is very much an opportunity to uh, move your career forward in a, in a much quicker way. That's great. Right here. Uh, hi. Good evening, uh, my name is Alexander de Avila. I'm a first year MPP student here at the Kennedy School and welcome. Uh, my question is, um, you know, I've come here to the Kennedy School to try to see how you create the same sort of cultural zeitgeist interest in serving first and, you know, that there currently exists for entrepreneurship and startup culture and consulting jobs, that, that sort of energy there is there for young people to go down those routes. How do you create that in a public service uh, avenue? And my question is, um, you know, you talked about the beaten path uh, or potentially being seen as not on the beaten path. Um, is there room for reinventing uh, the wheel in terms of how we talk to young people when they're deciding what to do with their careers and lives? Um, what kind of ways can we um, students who are interested in this go out there and find new ways to advocate for that expansion that, sh uh, that you folks were talking about about 20 minutes ago. Is there room to reinvent the wheel and room for new nonprofits and room for doing things in new ways? Is it a matter of uh, bigger budgets and recruiting in different ways or are there new ways we can push this and, and challenge this and, and innovate? Great question. So I do think there are there, there is room for new ways. Um, I was this morning uh, here in Boston at a swearing-in ceremony for 800 of the 2,450 new AmeriCorps members here just in Massachusetts. 
So the energy in that room was palpable, and the excitement of individuals who were about to embark on a year of service, some of whom were maybe one or two months in. So just the, the passion that they had um, was infectious. I think your question is about how do we get more of that and how do we inspire more of that? Um, word of mouth is our best bet, but that is a, and it's very effective, but it's also very limited, right? You'll, we have 75,000 people currently serving. They're going to touch millions of people, but they're going to leave untouched hundreds of millions. So um, increased budgets is part of it, but I think it, there's a, a virtuous cycle here in that the more people who serve, the more lives they touch, the more they tell, the more nonprofits recognize that service is a solution because service works actually for many, many strategies, but not all. So not every nonprofit or local government, because we also serve in local governments, have the capacity to provide a really meaningful year of service to their AmeriCorps teams. So we need to be both building up in that kind of natural way of uh, growing from within, but I think conversations like this, the fact that Harvard cares about this, you know, social entrepreneurship is increasingly a topic. Um, uh, as uh, we were discussing earlier, the social entrepreneurship of two Harvard students to create City Year. No one thought of that before, or maybe someone thought of that, but they didn't have the vision to execute on it, to, to grow it into what it has become. Um, so the, the importance of social entrepreneurship, for which there's now more funding than there's ever been, not enough, but you know, th there's more capacity to develop different strategies for using volunteers and also using service members is something that we need to continue down that path. And Harvard should be proud of the work they're doing. The Kennedy School should be proud of the work they're doing. But uh, I appreciate the question because I think there is real opportunity for growth, but there are impediments as well. I think that <clears throat> as we were talking earlier, that as Harvard creates a model for the importance of doing service as undergraduates, I think that those who are in the private sector and creating as new private sector opportunities are being developed, what needs to be, and this is where the leadership needs to be, that public service and community service is built into what the private sector is doing. Mm -hmm. And that as something's being created, do people set aside a half a day that is going to be for public service as part of the building process in the business itself? And I know we're increasingly working with some private sector companies that are saying we need to offer three months off or six months off for our employees to become Peace Corps volunteers through Peace Corps response. I think the conversations need to be in the sectors that are privately building these new wonderful products or activities for the future, they need to say an equal part of who we are is the time we give for our employees to do public service. So you both have talked about this. Did you have a follow-up? Oh, wait, sorry. Mm -hmm. You both have talked about the, the scale question, that there's capacity for that and the resources. What is, what is the case statement that you'd make? I mean, we're at a school of government right? Mm -hmm. And you have to testify before the Congress. Mm -hmm. How do you present the return on investment, if you will? How do you present the kind of case statement? Because if the pathway here is to expand opportunities, the demand is there, mm -hmm. both from prospective volunteers as well as the needs in the country and across the world. What is, the, you, what is your best case statement to make to really expand service? I would talk about a triple bottom line. And by that, I mean uh, and it's interesting, I've had the pleasure, and I say that with quotation marks around it, of testifying before Congress and, and, and making the case as best as possible. But uh, there's three ways of looking at it, and different audiences care about different pieces of service. So one is the impact that you're making in the community, be that the impact that you're making when you're helping uh, a community recover from a disaster, 
or a young person in a school um, learn and be able to make it to the next grade level. So that the impact can be measured, certainly the impact that a Peace Corps volunteer is having in their host country can be measured. So that's one piece. But the personal growth, the workforce development that happens, and we both talked about uh, what we've seen in terms of volunteers and members and how much they grow personally. And then thirdly, kind of the broad civic aspect of creating better citizens, people who are more in likely to vote. They're more likely to volunteer. They're more likely to be engaged in their community. So all those different pieces um, appeal to different investors. The, right now, the um, Institute is doing a research project on what we're calling that return on the investment as a capstone project for a group of about 20 undergraduates here at Harvard College. And it is a way of being able to further answer the question that you asked of what that return is and what can we say that having people serve overseas for two years, what does that bring back to this country? We know a lot what happens in other countries and I get to see it and feel it every trip I take overseas and largely the leadership in countries, the ministers, the presidents, the prime ministers, talk about their Peace Corps volunteer and the difference of who they are and what they've been able to give back to their countries because of Peace Corps. But here, it is also important that we, again, in terms of service, the number of returned volunteers who are in education, the number of volunteers who are working, returned volunteers who are working in other uh, cultural frameworks within the US, working in other languages, uh, working with nonprofit groups in communities, uh, the number that are part of, as I say, the health programs internationally, we can document the kinds of careers that return volunteers go into that are service careers. And we're saying, where else? Well, this is one of the strong ways to get the kind of background to be successful in this follow-up type career. For example, and let's take HIV AIDS just for a moment, uh, that the Peace Corps volunteers in working in this health, and they often go on and then get masters and doctorates in the field, but what is the behavior component? How do you listen to the person that you're working with? How do you help that person think through a kind of behavior that will be more protective than whatever behaviors are that they're doing now? It's having been that Peace Corps volunteer that strengthens what they're doing later on in that particular health career. And this is often what we talk about, that we make very strong citizens that are taking on so many challenges that we have here in the United States with a skill base that has been strengthened because of the two years as being a volunteer. So there's a domestic dividend yes. mm -hmm. to the Peace Corps. Yes. I think we have time for one last question. Hi, thank you for, thank you for speaking. Uh, my name is Julian. I am a recently returned Peace Corps volunteer from yeah. Ethiopia. Yeah. And I'm a new student also at the Kennedy School. Awesome. Uh, my question involves, well, uh, Peace Corps' current sectors include education, uh, agriculture, and health, and Peace Corps usually broadly operates in um, economically developing countries. All of these are expected to uh, intersect very dramatically with climate change. I was wondering if Peace Corps had any plans to concretely involve climate change in its programming, especially because many of the countries in which the volunteers are serving are also expected to be very adversely affected by that. The, um, our whole environmental program, and I don't know if you were involved in that uh, when you were serving, but uh, there are many countries where we're serving, where we're increasingly being asked, and again, we work with where the countries want us to be, that have us uh, work in the environmental areas, and whether that's different ways of crop production. Uh, I know that in countries that have uh, 
water around them, <laughs> particularly as we look at the Pacific and some of Asia and Central American countries, we're getting much more involved in how we uh, work with groups in communities with the climate change that's going on. So we come at it from a lot of different angles in the environmental training that we give based on what the countries are asking us to do. And we know that it's going to be a growing area. So I think I lied. I do see some questioners up there. Why don't we go right up here and there. We'll take both questions and then we'll get answers. Great. Uh, hi, I'm Carson. I'm a freshman in the college, and I just wanted to ask: in your careers or your experiences with public service or with service, uh, what has been the most meaningful or memorable moment that you've had with regard to service? B besides this forum. Besides the forum. <laughs> yeah. Got it. All right, we'll take that question, and then let's take this. We're gonna. Hi, I'm Alex. Down. I'm also first year at the college. Um, and a lot of countries around the world have like mandatory public service or mandatory national service. And I'm just wondering if you think that could be something that is useful to the United States. Great questions. So memorable moments, and we'll get into mandatory service. The, I've had many memorable moments, but the one that immediately came to mind was uh, the, my first day as a Peace Corps volunteer when I was standing in front of the classroom, my English I thought was perfect. I turned out it isn't quite perfect. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the students spoke three other languages, but, but they didn't speak English. So I'm standing here. I had been in the country four days, three days. And here are 40, 14-year-old boys staring at me in Sousse, Tunisia. And I was thinking, I had had training, but training suddenly went out of my head. What am I gonna do? Who am I? Why am I standing here? And I saw this door to my left that went outside, left the lycée, and I thought, I just wanna walk through that door. I, why am I here? What is this? And I remember these 40 sets of eyes just staring, waiting for me to do something. And that second of I don't know what to do, I'm just here in this country. I've never been on a plane before this moment. And I remember at that second thinking, okay, my husband's also here and he doesn't really want to go home. I've said <laughs> goodbye to my parents and they don't want to see me for another two years. I guess I'm here. And I remember taking two steps forward to these 40 students and saying, my name is Mrs. Olson. And with that, nothing has ever been the same. But it was that moment of courage, and it sounds silly because it was a matter of taking two steps forward and opening your mouth, but that was so fundamental for me because I knew as I took those two steps forward, I was gonna suddenly be a very different person. I had no idea what it was gonna be, but I was on it. I love that story. Um, I have to say, I've seen so many amazing volunteers and members do interesting things. Seeing um, members working with children is always really moving. But probably uh, post-disaster work is among the things that is most touching. So I had had the opportunity in the last year to visit um, with a family who had been not living in their home for over a year because of floods in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And this wasn't just any family. It was a mom with a 50-year-old daughter who was paraplegic. So their needs were more complicated. And so I had the honor of being there when our NCCC crews, our AmeriCorps crews, were uh, cutting the ribbon on the home. They had done all of the finishing work so that this mom and her daughter could get back in their home. And it was really, really touching. And if I, if you can indulge me for one more, um, also going to uh, Northern Florida after Hurricane Michael, mm. which the devastation was so much more vivid in person than it was on TV. And uh, meeting with teams of AmeriCorps members who were from very diverse backgrounds, uh, very different parts of the country, and they had come together to serve 
families that they would never see again, but would have such an enormous impact on their lives. And just to see the, uh, the eyes, the tears of families who've been helped. And, and I think why it's so poignant is the moment of vulnerability that people experience when their physical surroundings have been devastated by, by a disaster. So there's so many cool things that, that I've seen, but the post-disaster work is really poignant. Jody, we'll get you on the last question about, from a global perspective, seeing other countries that have service. Israel is mandatory. There, there are nations that have really focused and truly scaled up. As you travel the world, you've already been in six or seven countries in the past time as your uh, services director. How do you think about that and the implications for the United States? The one, there are many other countries, uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, the England, uh, I'm sorry, the, U the UK, uh, Korea, we can go on. But many other countries have service programs that are not dissimilar to Peace Corps. And in fact, several of the countries have created programs, Korea in particular, based on Peace Corps. What I think is important is, and let me give you a Rwandan example, that one Saturday a month, I found out when I was there two months ago, 85% of the population of Rwanda goes out and they, in small communities, talk for about 30 minutes, and then for the rest of that Saturday morning, they clean up, they fix up, they scrub up, they make that community something that they're really proud of, and they do it together. And when I finished the time there and was coming back to the United States, I was thinking, how can we learn from that? What is that that we could create that would have neighborhoods and communities know that they have a responsibility together to do something in that community? And this has been very much part of how Rwanda has managed and a component of its own healing process over these years is that process of service that everybody participates in. I think that service is should not be mandatory, but it should be so welcomed and expected as part of who we are as a citizen that it is something that we want to do. Well, I, um, we will leave it there, but we leave it with our thanks. I know both of your jobs so yes, very sure. well <laughs> and reasonably well, mm -hmm. and really I well. know how very well you're both doing them. So we thank you for your own public service here at the Kennedy School, and we thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.